One. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past ten years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. To preface this, I'd like to say that I am female, 21, but when I moved into my current home I was 13. I was living with both my parents, four cats, and a dog. I was myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she passed away, and her kids were selling the condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they're attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feeling that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Ellen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, now into some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks about it. So one day, I was probably around 14 at the time, I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in, but I also didn't want to just send a black screen, so I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started struggling to focus. It wouldn't take the picture, because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took, and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, and of course I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that other one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worse. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest. I will say I wasn't necessarily open-minded to a Wiccan. It seemed like BS at first, but this man had told me that there are ways we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light. But when set in front of a mirror, that the light doubles and turns impure dark. It's hard to explain, but I understood it as candle alone equals good, candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of the mirror and look into it, it can open a portal to a darker dimension. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking BS. But then I remember just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom. I had taken a photo, sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle damn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it, and get rid of it, or remove it, or whatever. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take the Wiccan stuff more seriously. A little while passed, and things seemed a little less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say I was possessed for a few hours, but for me it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time and memory where people are telling me I did things I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house. The same room I got scratched. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. 
So what I type from here until I snap out of it is told to me by witnesses, if that makes sense. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights started flickering in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and was like staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away, she knew something wasn't right, and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere, upstairs, main floor, basement, and looked in every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, I was standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked where I came from and that she was looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily it wasn't like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom, and she said no you weren't, I just looked there. When she said that, she said I completely changed and that she could tell like it enraged me. I told her she needed to leave, and I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl, talking to one of her best friends, that's definitely not like me. She tried to argue leaving, but... Apparently, the more she did, the more aggressive I got about getting her out. So, out of fear, she left, and her and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. A few hours passed, and no one knew what I was up to. I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered. The effing portal mirror. With the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared, or stop running, or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe this is... It felt like waking up from a nap, except I didn't remember falling asleep, or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we had done a little more research and talking with the priest and the Wiccan. I ended up finding out I had an attachment that I created with a Ouija board at 11, and then only strengthened with the mirror portal. I was blessed, and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house is still extremely haunted, and I have plenty more to share. Those are just some of the bigger things that have taken place. Smaller, long story short things include hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs. My dog won't go in the basement, hearing voices, getting touched, objects moving, orbs captured on camera. 2. This place where I used to work was located on a small boulevard, behind which was an alley which separated the business from a residential area. Typical suburban zoning. It was my habit to walk to a nearby deli to get lunch, and then find a nice spot in the adjoining neighborhood to eat it, typically on a curb in the shade of a tree. One day, while looking for a likely place, I noticed a tree whipping about much the way they do, when winds come, holding an approaching rainstorm. But this was a warm, still sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. I looked at the surrounding trees and shrubs, but all was calm. This one tree and this one tree alone was aggressively swaying to and fro. So I decided to sit upon the curb opposite and observe the situation to see if I could determine the source of the activity. As I watched, it became clear that there was no external wind which shook the leaves and branches, and indeed, there was no single direction in which they moved. It was as though a being was cavorting in, through, and around the tree, never going so low as to disturb the grass or roil the dust in the gutter below, but content to remain up in the branches, twisting itself this way and that, seemingly delighting in making the leaves and branches flutter. I tried to see if I could use the movements to determine the direction the being was traveling. The course which it took, and so by doing get an idea as to its shape and form, but this was not possible. So I resigned to sit and eat my lunch as I watched the extraordinary display. When my break was over, I went back to work, leaving the tree unbatedly dancing. The next day I returned to see if it was still there, and was not disappointed. I tried to communicate telepathically with it, but didn't receive anything, nor saw any indication if it was aware of my presence. It was like sitting in a park, watching a child play blissfully unaware it was being observed, 
or watching a dog cavort about, not knowing it was seen. The rest of the week, I would come and sit and marvel. I figured that I was witnessing one of two things. Either I was watching a discarnate being, desperately trying to affect physical reality for purposes unknown to me, or that I was seeing a small wind amusing itself. I came to accept the latter because I figured that a soul, whether human or jinn, would recognize my attention and try to capitalize on it, but the being was blithely content to ignore me. I have since learned that such elemental incarnations are part of the development of souls, one of the many rungs on an eternal ladder. I myself may have been such a force learning my lessons as I assert myself over my environment, playing with clouds and birds and trees and fallen leaves, whipping the waters to froth or gently rippling their surface. Astoundingly enough, now that I look back on it, I got bored and took to finding some place less royalsome to have my lunch. In retrospect, it was my inability to interact with it that lost my interest. Curiously, I never approached it, never stood beneath the tree as its leaves and branches spasmed about. And recall it, then as now, I felt honor to witness a wind at play, to have been given evidence that there is more, and that it was not for me to intrude. To this day, many decades later, when I drive past my old job place, I look down the street for the tree and think, that's where the wind was. 3. I used to live in a house with my parents, which both myself and my parents had very strange experiences in. However, my parents didn't let me know they had them, as they didn't want to spook me further. My room was particularly bad with the activities that used to happen all the time. Just to name a few experiences, there was someone knocking on my door saying my name when everyone was asleep. My guitar plectrum was thrown at me from across the room, and my guitar was often strung, all six strings, all at the same time. Obviously, if a string goes out of tune sometimes, one will strum, but all six was definitely no accident. Anyway, I've had this antique mirror for as long as I could remember. It was a past relative's, and I always used to notice handprints and fingerprints on it, even though I never touched it that much. They were everywhere, from top to bottom. My parents, obviously not wanting to let me know they were also aware of the paranormal things going on, said to me not to worry, and it was probably me touching it by mistake, etc. As they seemed so sure this was the case, I forced myself to not think about it, and carry on as if nothing weird was happening, which was very hard, as something was definitely going on. Eventually, my mum told me she was also concerned about my mirror, and needed to speak to me about something she'd seen other than the handprints. She never showed me the photo she took because she didn't want to scare me, but she said in the prints on the mirror there was a perfect face of a devil. She showed my dad and his friends this before taking a photo, and despite them not wanting to believe in this side of things, they both could see it too. Obviously, I didn't know how to react and thought perhaps something was after me. I mean, who knows? Mum decided to get some advice, so she had gone to a shop near me called Spellbound. They sell things of all types, but mainly they were all to do with the supernatural type of things, healing crystals, etc. As you can imagine, the people who worked there were all very aware of the spiritual world and different types of paranormal experiences, so my mum felt this was the best place to get advice. She spoke to a guy there about my mirror who said we had a few options, which were smashing the mirror completely to get rid of any negative energy, moving the mirror away from reflecting onto me sleeping in my bed, sage the room, or for me to wear a black tourmaline, either in a necklace or bracelet form to help protect me. I wasn't worried if we needed to smash the mirror as I was pretty terrified by this point. However, my parents didn't want to do this as it used to belong to one of my relatives, who wasn't with us anymore, so my mum bought me the black tourmaline, and we went on from there. I still noticed the fingerprints and handprints, but not so much strange experiences, so I felt perhaps the tourmaline worked. Mum did go back to Spellbound and spoke to the same guy again regarding that she thinks the tourmaline worked, but there's still handprints where he said again it might just be worth smashing the mirror. He began to explain how mirrors could be portals for demons, another life, and by keeping the mirror we could potentially be letting them directly into my room. 
is extremely dangerous. My parents still did not want to smash the mirror, typical, so I ended up taking it with me when I moved out a few months later, with every intention to smash it in my own time without them knowing. Well, when I first moved in, I did use it now and again to get changed, etc. While I looked for a new mirror, I was skint, but I would hang a towel over it when I wasn't using it. Anyways, one day my boyfriend put it up a bit higher in the bathroom to shave or something, I don't know, and he made sure it was secured so it had no way of falling. I had put it in the same position before, and I can literally 99.99999% tell you it could not fall, but as you can probably tell, it did. He left it for literally a few seconds to grab a towel, and within that time there was a huge bang and a smash. The mirror had literally shattered into tiny pieces, like even if I wanted to repair it, which I definitely didn't, there would have been no possible way. To this day, I believe that some sort of guardian angel or fate broke that mirror, because as soon as I moved in with the mirror, the flat felt uneasy, and as soon as we disposed of it, I felt so much better living there. Whether whatever was attached to the mirror followed me to the flat when I took it, I don't know. But nevertheless, I am so glad I am not dealing with that anymore. Please don't ask me why I didn't smash it sooner. It's hard when you're under 18, living with family, to try and get your way, as I'm sure you're all aware. 4. Back in 2018, I was living with my mother. I had been living with her for about three years at this point. I had just come out of a bad marriage and divorce prior, so she was my safe haven. Eventually, I was at the point where I wanted my own space, so I'd been applying for a few apartments. Months later, I got a call about a one-bedroom available, so I jumped on it. I was a bit hesitant initially because it had been so long since I'd lived on my own, and plus I had a fear of the dark. But I still moved and was excited about starting over in my own place. My first night, I pretty much spent hanging up my curtains, arranging my furniture and so forth. It was about 11pm and I was tired, and had to be at work early the next morning, so I got a shower and hopped in bed. I generally sleep with my TV on because it's hard for me to sleep in total silence, I don't know why. Anyways, it would be at least three more days until my internet would be hooked up, and I could use my fire stick. So I just put the TV on for light and dozed off. As I was asleep, I remember hearing something in my room closet slide across and fall. I literally heard it in my sleep, and it startled me so bad I was afraid to even get up and move. So I laid there, kind of just praying in my head like, God, please don't let me see anything I shouldn't see. Please protect me. So I ended up getting up maybe four hours later for work. And I remembered what happened, so I went into my closet to check it out. It was just my curtain that it fell. Thank God for that. But then I thought about it. How could it move from one side of the closet to the other without anyone moving it? I tried to write it off and eventually did. So fast forward three months later, I met a handsome gentleman who is my current husband. We had just started dating. He used to always come over every single weekend and would stay with me or sometimes a couple days a week. By that time, I had already got kind of used to living by myself, but it was also nice to have his company. One day I had to go to work, so he was at my house by himself. When I got home, he was like, yeah, so there was a huge spider in your house and I had to kill it. I don't know where it came from, but it was huge. I was honestly shocked because my apartment had no bugs, no rodents, no nothing. I didn't have a lot of stuff in my place at the time, so I don't have a hiding space at all for any of those things. Plus, my rent office got all the tenants' apartments sprayed every three months. Here I was, again, I wrote that off. One night when I was on the phone with my husband, who was then my boyfriend, we were talking about our weekend plans since he was coming down for the day. All of a sudden I hear water come on in my bathroom. The bathroom was across the hall from my room. So I got really quiet, and my husband asked me if I was okay. I said yeah, but my shower just come on by itself. He started laughing like, girl stop playing. I said no, I'm being serious. So I went in the bathroom to look, and indeed it was on. 
He was like, maybe it's just some water pressure. And again, I wrote it off. But by this time, I really started to think something was going on in my house. I am a seer. I've always been that way since I was a kid. I could look in a person's eyes and see everything about their life. I could also see other spirits that were not so friendly. Six months had passed and my husband had just moved in with me. I swear that night, when we went to sleep, I opened my eyes and I saw a little black girl standing in my doorway. Her attire looked like she was from the 50s. She had three braids in her hair and had on a little yellow dress. When I blinked my eyes, she was gone. I don't tell my husband at first because I didn't want to freak him out. Over time, different things continued to transpire. In my bathroom at night, I swear you could hear a woman humming, but it was coming from my air vents. I told my husband that and he didn't hear anything. I'd be in the living room looking at the TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I would see something too, and very black standing in my kitchen doorway staring at me. By this time, I'd gotten so used to things happening that I wasn't phased in the least. A year later, things really began to pick up activity. I would hear knocking and things would go missing. My husband thought it was my imagination and that I was just being overly sensitive at the time, particularly due to me being pregnant with my first child. Well, his opinion changed quick as we were in bed and we both heard knocking on the wall in our bedroom while we were wide awake. From that point on, my husband believed me and he started seeing things as well. He got to where he would sleep with the big ceiling light on and I asked him why. He came out and told me he's been seeing what he refers to as the imp in the house. That he saw it standing at the end of our bed and that it would rub on him and so forth. I believed my husband because I knew things were happening. He hates my mirror I had in the hallway. I had a swivel mirror, the kind that rotates. He said it made him feel uneasy. My mom bought it for me as a housewarming gift in my new apartment. So he eventually would cover my mirror up because he was so afraid. Fast forward two years later. I had my first son and was now pregnant with my second child. I started seeing things more at that point. My husband was working a shift where he had to be at work at 3 a.m. So every time he left for work, I took all I needed for me and the kids, put it in the bedroom, and would lock the door until it got light outside. One of those times I was in the room and I went into a dreamlike vision, where I saw feet moving under the door as if someone was in my house and something came into the room and held me down and walked towards my son's bed and he started screaming. At that point, I came out of it and grabbed my son. And when I looked at my wall, I saw the silhouette of a goat's head and damn near passed out. I called my husband and told him I couldn't do it no more and packed up my kid's stuff and went to my mom's where I literally stayed off and on for six months. During this time period, I had a lot of bad luck. We kept trying to move, and every time we found something, it would fall through. We began to lose a lot of things. My husband began to change and have crazy behavior. Mind you, he was still living in the house, being attacked on a daily basis. We had a next-door neighbor who would come and sit with us sometimes. She was a very young girl. She had a young son. The last time I saw her was the day before Christmas. She was over chatting. A week later, she was murdered and her mother was murdered, and her mom died in my yard. You can still see the body imprint. After that, me and my husband finally moved. I sometimes ride past that old place, and can still feel the evilness in there, watching, waiting for its next victim. The place is occupied by another tenant. I pray they never experience what I have. Five. During my time at university, I had a part-time job at a huge Bavarian company. The building had eight floors and a quadratic shape, with a big lobby hall in the center of the building. It was actually hundreds of years old, but completely renovated. I worked once or twice a week, mainly on weekends. Now here's the interesting part. I worked in night shifts, and my job was basically to walk around the whole building twice a night. While walking through the hallways, I just had to watch out for stuff people forget when they rush into the weekend. Open doors, open windows, or light switches still turned on. Nothing out of the ordinary. The payment was also good. In fact, I was kind of surprised about how good the payment was. 
because obviously I didn't have to do much in those eight hours. My girlfriend and other friends mentioned that the payment is just fair, as I had to walk around a huge building at night completely alone. They always mentioned how they would never do this. Sometimes my girlfriend visited me there to bring me some meal. As the sinister feeling in the buildings, like these, would play mind games with them. I never had problems with being alone. Neither was I paranoid or believe in paranormal occurrences. I just studied throughout the night and did my two walks. Until this one night in September 2018. The shift started like any other. Got keys from the janitor and started studying. After my first walk through the building between 3.55am and 4.05am, the whole electronic system throughout the building resets, which I found really odd at my first shift. But grew to ignore it after some months. The janitor explained the reason after I asked. The reset leads to light sources turning on and off throughout the building. Systematically, but still chaotic. I sat at the front desk not even paying attention to it when suddenly... A certain noise reached me. One of the two elevator doors in the first floor opened itself, closed itself, and opened itself again. Eh. Malfunction, I thought. Going back to reading boring scientific papers. After twenty minutes, it happened again. But this time, the light in the elevator switched off. Which really seemed off. At this point, I started to feel a little bit alarmed. When I moved into the elevator, the door behind me closed. I panicked and tried to get out of the elevator. But it even started to take me to the second floor in complete darkness. When I reached the second floor, the door opened and I basically fell out of the elevator door, turning around while I fell. The really sinister looking, completely dark elevator closed again and took off to another floor. My heart was racing and a part of me thought someone manipulated the console. But another part of me felt something else. I had goosebumps all over my body and returned to the front desk, with a plan to text my supervisor and the janitor about a technical defect of the elevator. I did this with trembling hands when I suddenly heard another distant noise. Radio music from somewhere in the canteen. I slowly moved to the canteen with my smartphone light switched on. The noise came from the kitchen and I followed it. Reaching the kitchen, I saw that a radio was playing music on some of the tables. The cooks listened to radio while working. I froze and couldn't breathe. During my first walk, the janitor texted me and told me to put the radio under a certain desk and switch it off, as the cooks would always store it there. I did this directly when I started the shift, even texting him. Even I couldn't find the desk at first after plugging out the radio. I turned around and sprinted through the canteen directly to an exit, and waited outside for the last two hours. Luckily, I had the keys with me when someone from the day shift came. When he arrived, I got into the building with him, took my bag, and left quickly. I called myself in sick for the next two weeks. After that, I quit the job using the excuse of my sleep cycle. To this day, I don't know what happened that night. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 268. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you'd be so good as to share the video around, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'd like the paranormal videos to do a bit better than they are, and the only way to do that is to get more people watching them and listening to them and licking them. Okay, maybe not the last part, but certainly the first two. That would be great. Okay. This is a Friday, isn't it? The day for frying food, I believe. That's why it's called Fry Day. I should probably go make some sausages or something. Uh, just to respect the day, you see, of course, yes. Uh, right now, see, tomorrow's Saturday. I will endeavour to do a stream tomorrow. No promises, as, as always, these days, things are up and down with me. But we'll see what we can do. Okay, with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.